Hello everyone, and welcome back to Let's Play The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. In this episode, we're gonna be- it's kinda like a- a casual episode, I guess. We're gonna get everything set up to go through this passageway right here so we can get to the next temple, and the first thing that we're gonna need to do is talk to this guy right here. Whoa! Up here, up here! I am sorry to bother you from such a high place, but I am very hungry and I have gotten stuck here. Well, I want to hear more about this, uh, situation you've got going on up there. Oh, it is so cold. I'm so very hungry. I don't think I'm gonna make it. I just want to eat once more before I die up here. Something tough and hard to chew. I cannot forget that flavor. That's a really morbid situation that is in this game, but we are probably going to be able to find something for that guy to eat up there, or that guy probably wouldn't even be up there. But the other thing that I want to show you, in the last episode I said we're going to go on a tour of this area. There's not that much stuff to do in this one particular area, but this place right here is the Mountain Smithy, which it says we work hard for, so your sword works hard for you. I always thought that was kind of a funny catchphrase that the Smithy has to advertise their area, their shop or whatever. We can't use that right now for two reasons. The first reason is their Smithy, or whatever you want to call it, like their forge basically is frozen over which doesn't make much sense because you wouldn't think that a forge like that would be able to be frozen but anyway regardless we can't use it we will be able to technically use it before this episode is over and not even too far from right now as far as time goes the other reason that we don't really want to use that though is because like i said in the last episode they can upgrade our sword the problem is we don't have the requirements basically to upgrade our sword all the way and there are three there's two sword upgrades technically in the game there's a third fourth sword, I guess. I'm getting my numbers mixed up. Basically, we can upgrade the Kokiri sword twice. The second upgrade is re required to get the third upgrade, but the second upgrade only works for 100 swings of the sword, so I'm not going to worry about that right now. The other thing I'm not going to worry about is the dialogue here from Tingle, because we've heard it all before. The only thing new here that we need to get is the Snowhead map here, which, of course, is 20 rupees. I think I've gone over many times the difference in price that Tingle will give his maps between areas, and right now the Snowhead Temple map is only 20 rupees, and that was it. I don't even know what happened there. See, that's one thing I kind of want to mention. I mentioned in like the first episode that Z-targeting is kind of weird in Majora's Mask, a little bit different than it was in Ocarina of Time. In Ocarina of Time, you could like look in a direction, Z-target, and instantly walk in that direction. In this game, it's like you've got to wait for the camera to move behind you. I'll try and demonstrate what I'm talking about. I'm going to turn this way, and then I'm going to try and Z-target and instantly walk in that direction, but it's going to turn me back around and make me walk in that direction towards the tree. And that's exactly that work, so it's kind of like a reproducible problem, and it's not really a problem unless you played so much Ocarina of Time and you kind of expect that to be how it works, and that's why I fell off that bridge right there. But I do kind of want to examine this white wolfos right here. It's a white wolf host lured in and watch its movements. It doesn't like its tail to be touched. The easiest way to get to its tail, I found, is either throw a bomb or do the spinning attack, which now that we have the larger spinning attack that we got from the Great Fairy in the last episode, that is now the, probably in my opinion anyway, the best way to take out the white wolf host. But the white wolf host are not really that big of a problem in this game. It seemed like the wolf host in general and the dino host and that just type of enemy was a lot more of a problem in Ocarina of Time. Maybe I just got better, you know, playing Ocarina of Time so much. It's just kind of like second nature in Majora's Mask. But I just find those to be much easier now. Now though we are in Goron Village, we can't really do too much right here. So I'm going to go ahead and just advance the plot. And you might notice that the owl, Kapura Gabora, or whatever his name is. I never knew how to say his name. But anyway, we're going to talk to him. Before I talk to him, though, I want to point out that the there's those temple or like towers over there that you can see. Those towers are the final temple in the entire game. And I always thought it was really cool how you can see the final part of the game from the second part of the game. And it really reminds me, I know I've made a lot of Dark Souls references, but it really reminds me a lot of Dark Souls, how you can see like the final areas of the game or just other areas of the game from pretty much any area in the game. But I'm going to go ahead and talk to the owl. Hoo hoot! We meet again, fairy child. Have my stone statues been of help? Well, it seems you may have the strength to change the fate of this land as I had expected. But the road ahead is even more challenging. Many trials await you. Please watch over these Gorons around you. Their land is doomed to be smothered in snow and ice forever. It will become a land where no living thing can survive. Without courage and determination, you surely will collapse from the extreme conditions. But if that courage and determination burns bright within you, then that's another story. Will I proceed? Of course. Hoo hoot! You are a child of many strengths. Well, perhaps you do have enough strength to change the fate of this mountain after all. 
I shall take to the air now, flying towards thy shrine across the way, so follow behind me. Do not be daunted by appearances. Instead, let your feelings guide you, and the true path shall open before you. Are you ready? Follow behind me. Now, I've always really liked this area as well, and before I go on the path there, which we gotta kinda hurry because those feathers will disappear, but I like the fact that that first feather falls on a platform. That's supposed to be, I guess, the game's way of telling you that these feathers will also land on platforms that you can jump on. I always thought that was a really cool way of letting them know. You know, one thing I've noticed, basically what this all comes down to, is after playing a lot of games and being older now, I can look back to these old games and see exactly what they were, you know, kind of like the design philosophy a little bit, but that's really not too bad to get across that. Hoo-hoo, I have certainly been assured of your courage and determination. From here on, you must not be fooled by appearances. You must rely on your feelings. Now, enter the shrine. Something that will aid you in your quest lies within. Use that item when you're returning from here. So that one was a little bit less, you know, transparent. I guess it's a little more explicit what he tells us to do in this case. Just getting over here, though, I thought it was a really cool way that they give you some, you know, a demonstration, I guess you could say, of the mechanics of what's going to be in that chest right there. Might as well go ahead and try and get rid of some of this grass. Yeah, I was going to say, a lot of these have bombs in them, and you might wonder why. Or maybe not, because there are a lot of rocks around here. The only thing is, the only thing I think there is in this area, and the rocks anyway, is in this one over here. I believe this is a red rupee. A purple rupee? Well, I guess I'm wrong, but in that case, I can't say I'm too displeased that I'm wrong. Anyway, let's go ahead and open the elephant in the room, the golden treasure chest, and see what's inside. We get the Lens of Truth much earlier than we did in Ocarina of Time, so we can see through it and see things that are not normally available to be seen, like those platforms are going to be visible once we turn back around and go out there. But before we do that, I want to go ahead and show you that there is a hidden treasure chest and a hidden Skulltola. I don't think that's even visible without the Lens of Truth. If I look up there without it on, and it isn't even, it's not up there, so I like that as well. It's kind of like the first room you get the item. You get to use it pretty much right away. I'm kind of disappointed that I didn't hit him. I kind of want to take him out with a bomb. I just find it to be easiest to take him out with a bomb. I really didn't think that one was going to hit him, especially since it was so much farther away than the first bomb I threw. And there was a treasure chest in the way. And by the way, there's that red rupee that I thought was in the other treasure chest. So at least I got the fact that there was a red rupee in that room right at all. But the thing that we got to worry about now is that there are no feathers that we can look at to tell where the platforms are. Luckily, we did get the Lens of Truth, so we can just pretty much hop across these platforms, and it would be very difficult to jump across these without the feathers on them, I guess, and without the Lens of Truth, so that's why I guess they dropped the feathers. That thing, or that glitch, or whatever you want to call it, the Z-targeting thing, almost just killed me right there because I thought it was going to center behind me. Luckily, I'm going to, I guess, be a little more careful from now on and look where I'm jumping first before the Z-targeting kind of screws me over. Anyway, that was a little bit harder there towards the end than I thought it was going to be. But with the Lens of Truth on, we can see this figure right here. I'm not sure if the Lens... Yeah, if the Lens of Truth is not on. His shadow's on the ground, so you can at least tell he's here. I'm not sure if you can talk to him, though, without the Lens of Truth. I don't... Yeah, it doesn't look like you're going to be able to. So you can actually kind of see him without the Lens of Truth, but you're not able to talk to him unless you have the Lens of Truth on. But let's go ahead and see what he has to say. Can it be? Are you able to see me? If you truly can see me, then follow behind me. Now, in life, there are things that come across or come up that you can either take the easy way out or you can do it the right way. What people always say is to take the easy way out, or perhaps they always say to do the right thing. I'm not even entirely sure, but in this case, we are going to be taking the easy way out. We're not even going to follow the ghost there. I don't know why, I just always feel like, you know, if something is easier in a game, I guess I just like to do it the easy way better, which kind of sounds a little bit scummy, I guess. But anyway, you don't actually have to follow him you can use the Song of Soaring to soar back to the owl statue that we started off the episode at, and we can just go where he was going to lead us anyway. So if you were playing this game for the first time, you would definitely not... Well, maybe def maybe not definitely not. You probably would not be able to figure out where he was going without actually following him. But since I have played this game and I know exactly where he's going to go, I figured I would just go ahead and go ahead. Go ahead and go ahead. Let's say it many times. Go ahead and warp to the place where I know he was going to go. Now, when you equip the Lens of Truth and you use it, 
on the wall here a ladder will appear and the ladder there's a it's kind of a winding path but there's only one way to actually get to the top and I thought that was kind of weird how there was only one way to get to the top of this I figured there might be at least two paths to get to the top but you actually do have to take the exact right path through this ladder puzzle if you will now you might notice that we're getting kind of low on magic and that is because the lens of truth will drain your magic and climbing up that, it seems like a big waste of magic when you have to use the Lens of Truth pretty much all the way up. You don't actually have to, you can tap the Lens of Truth, I think this is also able to be done in Ocarina of Time. But if you just tap the Lens of Truth button over and over, it will not drain your magic. And also in Ocarina of Time, I do believe that if you play the Song of Storms, and then immediately use the Lens of Truth, the Lens of Truth would also not use magic. But as you can see, Darmani is here in his grave and we did not have to follow him so that is the easy way of getting this whole side quest or actually it's not even a side quest it is the main quest but i think this is the easiest and fastest way to get this done the soaring one said the one who could see me would be arriving soon it seems that it turned out to be true i am darmani the third the blood of proud goron heroes runs in me this feels strange for me to say but when i was alive i was a renowned warrior and veteran yes when i was alive but alas, I am now dead. I was fine until I marched off to Snowhead by myself, hoping that I could drive off a demon. It had been wreaking havoc on Goron Village, then the blizzard of Snowhead blew me into the valley, and now, here I am. How infuriating! As I am, I can only watch th as Goron Village is slowly buried in ice. I may have died, but I cannot rest. So, you can use magic. The Soaring One also told me that you were able to use it. I beg you, bring me back to life with your magic. If it is beyond your power, then I beg of you to do this for me instead. Heal my sorrows. Any way that you can do it will suffice. Please, heal my sorrows. So I thought, I well, I think at the beginning of the episode, I said that the starving guy up there that just wanted to eat one more time was a little bit sad, but this really takes the cake for me. This guy died trying to protect his village, and he died, of course he died in the attempt. But now he has to watch as the evil that he went to try and get rid of is now terrorizing the village and he can't do anything about it but we do have a way of healing people's sorrows so let's go ahead and do that right now And Armani kind of gave up the spirit to give us the Goron Mask, which we are going to need to complete the game. That sequence right there where he died or whatever was really... Man, it really kind of eats at me a little bit. Just the fact that all of the Gorons were, you know, kind of cheering him on, or maybe not even cheering him on, just kind of like letting him go. Always kind of really got to me is one of the saddest parts of this entire game. All the Goron wanted to do, all Darmani wanted to do, was, you know, just protect his people, and he was unable to do so. But he has passed that on to us, I guess, that problem on to us. Let's go ahead and try and check the grave, like he said. Unfortunately, it's written in letters we have never seen before. Luckily, though, we do have the Goron Mask, and I don't know if I mentioned this, every time you get one of these transformation masks, the first time you wear it, you have to watch that, like, tormenting scene, and that kind of, I'm not sure if they were trying, what they were trying to do with that, maybe kind of show you that the, 
you know, the sorrows that the person of the mask you were wearing went through in their life. I'm not entirely sure. Maybe I'm looking too far into it. But now that we are a Goron, we should be able to read Goron writing. And all this is, I'm actually not going to read this or anything. All this really is, is just kind of like a, a memorial. And also, it is kind of the, the techniques that the Goron has. But I don't think we really need to learn those because I already know what the techniques are. And over the course of the game, we will, and I, but we will, I mean, I will, be able to show you all the techniques without actually having to read everything. But this guy over here does not believe that we, that we are the great Darmani because of course Darmani died. And this fellow right here, I think is actually going to explain why this is such a weird coincidence that Darmani just walked out of the grave. Yeah. Then just whose grave was I making? Did you come back to life because it was so warm beneath your grave? I'm not sure that that's the reason why I came back to life, but he did give us a clue right there. And also the fact that his friend was frozen right next to him, kind of all that tied together, is supposed to show us that we can move the grave. I feel really bad doing this, especially since Darmani, even though he's not in the game that much, it kind of makes me feel bad that we're kind of desecrating his grave a little bit. And you know, it kind of is weird now that I think about it, that there is a hot spring under his grave. Like they built his grave over a hot spring. The good thing though that they did that, because we're going to need the hot water from the grave now unfortunately we got to give some to that guy right there that was frozen i'm not even sure if we ha technically have to do that i do feel good usually though helping people out in this game so we're gonna go ahead and unfreeze this guy luckily we do have the by the way i don't know if i showed this or not obviously i didn't because it just happened this is hot spring water if we don't do something with it quickly it will turn into regular spring water and it will be unable to melt ice oh. Huh? What have I been doing? Oh, are you alright, brother? You were frozen, but the great Darmani saved you! The great Darmani? What's with you? Are you half asleep? Did you hear this guy? The great Darmani died long ago and is lying in his grip. He, Darmani! I was shocked too, but somehow it seems the great Darmani isn't dead. R really? With this, a star of hope appears in Goron Village. Great Darmani, please do something about the blizzard blowing in front of Snowhead. I'm not sure, like I said, if we technically have to do that little sequence right there, but it's always a good idea, like I said, to try and help as many people as possible in this game, because that's kind of the point of the game, even though that fellow right there was not in the Bomberman... Bomberman? What am I even playing anymore? They were not in the Bomber's Notebook, so we don't actually technically have to help them out, but I think they kind of did give us a clue about where we're supposed to go next. I was kind of hoping I would bounce off that little piece of snow right there onto this platform over here. Unfortunately, that did not happen. But yeah, I think the point of that little thing right there was to tell us exactly where to go next because we don't technically know where to go next. They kind of said to go towards Snowhead, but we don't have anything that we can use to get rid of the bl giant blizzard or whatever they said that we have to watch out for. But I did collect the spring water, the hot spring water, because we need to come over here and melt this block of ice right here Unfortunately, I just walked straight into it, and if you do that, it will turn you into ice as well, which doesn't really make much sense at all. You know, if you just go by the laws of entropy and all that, I don't think that that would exactly happen. Unfortunately, in this game, it does. It's not that big of a deal, though. The only problem is that it will, you know, freeze you for quite a bit of time, and like every half a second or every second that you're in here, or in the ice, you will take damage. But in here, there is another hot spring so we can come back here to get hot water instead of having to go all the way back up to Darmani's grave which of course is a good thing because we had to climb all the way up that ladder and we don't want to have to do that but I've been using a technique here without really explaining it too much the Gorons can roll and specifically Darmani can roll into a spike or you know can make spikes come, up his, come out of his body and this fella right here is the gatekeeper for this building that I'm standing in front of so if we talk to him you're Darmani. How? You're alive? Do I want to enter Goron Shrine? Yes, I do, because that is where we need to go next. He can open the door to Goron Shrine with a, a Goron Bounce or Pounce or whatever he just said. I didn't actually catch it, but that Pounce will open that door right there. We do not actually have to have the Gatekeeper open the door. We can do it ourselves because if we curl up into a ball, we can pound the ground. And that is exactly the technique that that Goron just used. On the first day, though, the gatekeeper is standing somewhere around here and the gatekeeper will open the door for you on days two and three though he is stuck in that snowball so if you want him to open the door you gotta go find him but like i said we don't ever have to have him open the door we can open it ourselves 
But since we're in the Goron Shrine, which looks a lot like Goron Village or City or whatever it was in the Ocarina of Time, I want you to go ahead and listen to exactly what the racket is that's going on here. I always found this to be extremely annoying. I'm not really sure why. I mean, I guess I do know why. It's pretty annoying that he's, you know, yelling and crying. Let's go ahead and see if we can't calm him down just a little bit. Wah! Uh, wah! D daddy! Daddy! I'm cold! Daddy! Aw, oh, darn me. Where's my daddy? Where's my daddy? I guess we're going on another little quest. We gotta find that little kid's dad. You know who he reminds me of? He reminds me of Gohan at the beginning of Dragon Ball Z. How he always cried every five seconds until, you know, Piccolo whipped him into shape. We're gonna have to whip that little kid into shape. Actually, we're gonna do something a little bit less drastic than whipping him into shape. But we're not certainly going to train him to become a skilled fighter or anything, as Piccolo did. What we are going to do is come back to this hole right here. I can't believe that white wolfos didn't hit me right there, but we're going to come back to this hole, and because there is a hot water spring in here, we are going to stand in here and scoop up a little bit of water. And by the way, water is kind of dangerous to Gorons. I don't know why I didn't explain this, but if you are in water that is over your head pretty much as a Goron, you will drown and you'll restart, kind of like the Dekus, except the Gorons, of course, do not have the ability to hop on water as it, you know, just looking at their physiology, you wouldn't think that they would, probably. But this snowball over here, there is a Goron inside of here, and we just happen to have a little bit of hot water. Let's go ahead and melt him out of this ice. Huh? What was I doing? Ah, it's already this late. I must hurry. You might be able to tell that this is going to take absolutely forever, so let's go ahead and talk to him again. Huh? Oh, you're Darmani! But you're supposed to be dead. Am I hallucinating? Maybe this is also the doing of Snowhead's magic power. Hmm, I've been made a fool of. But that's impossible. I refuse to flinch. If I can see past the illusion, you'll vanish in an instant. What? My son is crying because he misses me. Why do you know that? My son misses me. Oh, forgive me, my child. Your father has work to do. Darmani, be you a ghost or a figment of my imagination, I no longer care. If you feel pity for my crying son. And now you can see that the instrument that the Goron has in this game, or our Goron form, is the drums, but now the Elder here is teaching us the beginning of Goron's lullaby. Let's go ahead and play that. It's not that I forgot it, it's just so cold that I can't play very well. At any rate, I'm counting on you. So now that we know the beginning of the Goron Lullaby, we need to go back and play that to the little child. Luckily, the Goron is able to roll straight up little slopes like that, and the White Wolfos just took a dive straight into the valley there or whatever. Like I said, I find this area to be so just sad on pretty much every front. The Goron Elder is too frail to get back 
to his child who is crying for him. And he had to teach the beginning of the lullaby that he's too senile to remember to a dead ghost or to the, you know, the living incarnation of somebody that he thought was dead. And that dead person gave his life to save a city and he died in the process. I think you might be able to tell why I figured that this is the saddest part of the game. But let's go ahead and try and calm down this little kid. That song, that's the song daddy always plays for me before I go to sleep. I'll sing the next part. Mmm, it's just like daddy's right beside me. <laughs> Apparently we set everybody to sleep or we put everybody to sleep with the Goron Lullaby except ourselves, so I guess. It is kind of like, oh my goodness, can we stop locking onto this Goron? It's kind of like when you make an annoying sound and nobody else or everybody else but you is annoyed by it. I guess it's kind of the opposite situation right here. But what we need to do now, which might not be immediately obvious, is we need to take the fire from this Goron or from that torch right there and try and light all of these torches. I've always had a problem with this. It's pretty hard to me. But if we get all of the torches lit, something will happen. So let me go ahead and see if I can't do this. I really thought there was no way that was going to work because I accidentally picked up that rock like halfway through. I thought that was going to be just enough time lost to not actually be able to come down here and light these. That first try, I didn't realize there was one out in the middle of those two, so I kind of messed that up a little bit. But what that did was allow the middle area to start spinning. And now that it is spinning, I need to take shots at it with my rolling technique because there was something hidden inside of it that we need to collect. And I guess it wasn't in that one. Let me go ahead and wait or, you know, keep doing this until I get what we need out of this spinning chandelier. And there we go, guys. I got the rock sirloin out of the chandelier, which does not make much sense whatsoever. I'm really not even sure how you're supposed to know that's up there, but that is the food that we need to take back to the guy at, that we saw at the very beginning of the episode that was pretty much starving. So I will meet you guys back there. I would teleport. The only problem is that you can't warp while you're carrying this. So I will meet you guys back there.
That's it! It's so good that I dream about it! Dodongo Cavern's finest quality rock sirloin! This is my absolute favorite. Bless be this meal! Oh, my energy has returned to me! I am coming down now. Wait one moment! Oh, I wondered who it might be. Why, if it isn't Darmani, you are... alive? Yes, I see. That is the reason why you knew my favorite food. Oh, I almost forgot. Please accept this as a token of gratitude. And for that, we get the Don Giro's mask. I'm not sure how you're actually supposed to pronounce it. I always think of it as... I hate to make another Dragon Ball Z reference, but... I always imagined it to be Dr. Zero's mask from Dragon Ball Z. That's probably why I pronounce it that way. It could be any other pronunciation of those couple of letters. Like I said, not entirely sure. But now, we have everything we need to get through to the temple. The major one of which being the Goron Lullaby. And I will show you why that, why we need that in just a second. But first, we need to roll through all of these snowballs. Luckily, we have a lot of magic or we wouldn't be able to have the spike form. If you're not in your spike form and you roll into one of those snowballs, I think it will knock you back. So it's lucky that we did have as much magic as we did. But a lot of those snowballs that we ran into seemed to drop magic. So overall, I guess we were okay in any situation. But anyway, you might notice that there is a lot of wind blowing around up there. And if we take out our mask of or our lens of truth, I guess I tried to put it on the Goron slot there, which I don't know if I mentioned this, but if you have a mask on one of your C buttons that you're wearing, you can't put an item over that. But if we look up there, we will see what looks to be a representation of Big Oron from the first game. And that is supposedly who blew Darmani off into the abyss down there. And we will take care of him in the next episode. As for right now, I want to go ahead and save this owl statue because like I said, we are pretty much right in front of the second temple in the game. And that opening up there is the second temple in the game. Before I go, though, there's one thing I want to talk about just very briefly. The temple in the game, or the... I don't even know where I was going with that. The guy that we just held by throwing Rock Sirloin up on that ledge said that that Rock Sirloin was the best from Dodongo's Cavern or something like that. As far as I know, there is no Dodongo's Cavern in this game. So I always thought it was kind of weird how he mentioned that because, of course, that is the second child dungeon in the first game. I just wanted you guys to mull over that baby in the comments or something like that. But I want to thank you guys for watching this episode of Let's Play The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask, and I hope to see you guys back for the next episode.